The um, format for tonight is that um, Peter will talk for um, you know maybe thirty to forty minutes uh, on his um, you know life's work really, um, and it's fabulous to have such an expert in our midst. And you'll know that um, Peter is the lead author of our caterpillars, moths, and their plants of Southern Australia, um, and. Um, so Peter can tell you a little bit about his um, history, but obviously grew up in um, Adelaide and Warradale, not very far away from where we are. So enjoyed this environment, enjoyed getting out into all sorts of ecosystems and um, studying and researching, and um, it's really great to have him back here. So um, Peter is also working with us on developing a, uh, uh, an app uh, which we call, we'll probably call what caterpillar is that, but we'll see, um, we'll do some focus groups on that, eh? Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it is really great to have Peter here, and um, so he'll talk, and then what we'll do is we will break for uh, our food, and whilst you're gathering food and chatting, we'll then have some question and answers whilst people are, are eating their supper. Um, and uh, and then we'll be able to uh, showcase our special desserts as well. So um, you'll be really very pleased to see what Miyuki has done with her food art. So over to you, Peter. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Jerry. Um, it's a pleasure to be back here in Adelaide. Um, my old stamping ground. So whenever I come over, I try and make an afternoon or a day and then go around to some of my old collecting sites uh, from Hallett Cove to Monazo to Torrens Island, wherever I can get to. So if you bump into a strange character hunched over, looking at uh, plants and things, it's probably me. So what caterpillar is that? Well, that title, of course, connects to a famous Neville Cayley book from the 1930s called What Bird Is That? So we've used this as our working title as Jerry says, for uh, developing an, an app or a, a website or some combination that builds upon the, uh, the book that came out in uh, 2019. Uh, quite often these working titles are not becoming the title anyway, so that may well be the title of the app. Does anybody know that caterpillar, by the way? You might like take a stab. It's one of the more spectacular caterpillars that occur around Adelaide. Indeed, it's Camacris Bayerii. <laughs> but it is a truly spectacular caterpillar that feeds on mistletoe, which is the same food plant as the, uh, um, the butterfly on the logo for the, um, the, the Butterfly Conservation Group, the Delia Saganabi. Um, so it's possibly a, a poisonous caterpillar, nobody really knows, but um, it turns into a rather lovely black and white moth named after a, a German called Bayer who came out into Adelaide in the 1840s um, and later went to California. Had a wonderful collection of Australian butterflies and moths that was destroyed in the Great Earthquake of 1906 in San Francisco, sadly. So <clears throat> what's the point of a caterpillar? It, they're a fairly strange life form after all, a rather amorphous bag of flesh, um, rather soft bodied. Uh, totally unlike the butterfly moth they turn into. So here you've got this life form that has this strong contrast in body form and shape and behaviour and food that it feeds upon. So broadly speaking, these strong metamorphosis type uh, groups um, evolve because there's an efficient division in labour between the larva stage and the adult stage. So caterpillars are a very efficient way to harvest food from plants to turn plant biomass into animal biomass because they're broadly um, a set of very powerful mandibles at the front end, uh, a large digestive sac, and they produce vast amounts of uh, faeces that are basically compressed organic matter. So there is an important part of the nutrient cycles in forests and grasslands and elsewhere. And, uh, a caterpillar will commonly eat about its body weight in food every two or three days. So 
Caterpillar is the longest living stage, so over a 12-month cycle, it might be a caterpillar for 10 months, a pupa for a few weeks, and then an adult butterfly moth for another fortnight or a month at the most. Plus, caterpillars are very nutritious uh, for birds and parasites and other things, so they're highly sought after as a food supply in their own right. So here's uh, a little bit about the anatomy of a, uh, a caterpillar. So uh, they have a strong, seg a strong segmentation from uh, head to tail. Um, so you have a head section which is strongly sclerotized, mainly because uh, uh, it has the muscle attachments inside the head that drive the mandibles. So the mandibles, as you know, are very powerful. Um, they have uh, they have between four and six eyes um, in, in a semicircle, and importantly, they have the spinneret uh, underneath the mandibles here. Um, the, the segments there's three thoracic segments with uh, the true legs. So insects have six legs. True insects have six legs. Uh, so three pairs. Um, at the back end, they have these uh, pro legs, which are uh, uh, just uh, uh, hydraulically operated bags of flesh, really, but uh, they allow the caterpillar to grasp onto the vegetation very efficiently. Um, and the um, the spiracles uh, are present on most segments, but not but not all. But you notice that these uh, pro legs at the tip they have these semicircles of what are called crotchets, and these crotchets engage the silk that's laid down by the caterpillar. So as the caterpillar moves, it's always laying down silk uh, as, a, as a microscopic thin line. So if it gets um, disturbed, it can drop on the silk line uh, away from a predator. So silk was a key innovation in the evolution of the Lepidoptera. So silk's evolved multiple times in arthropods, so famously spiders, but also some crickets evolved to produce silk um, and a uh, couple of other obscure insect groups but most comprehensively silk almost defines the, uh, the butterflies and moths and once it evolved it allowed caterpillars to do extraordinary things so silk is basically a polymer of amino acids that's stored in large glands in the body uh, as a liquid and when it's uh, when it's brought together through the spinneret it instantly solidifies into silk and it's a strong, very strong waterproof fibre, as you know. Uh, very lustrous, I mean, it's a multi-billion dollar industry and it's been used by humans for millennia as, as a luxury product. Um, but it also has properties like, for example, it, it, as it dries, it shrinks. So a small caterpillar can actually turn over a tough eucalypt leaf and, and fold it in half by spinning these silk structures here and as the silk dries, it draws the leaf together, and hence they can make leafy nests and uh, bag nests and all sorts of things. And those retreats that then protect the caterpillar from predators and from desiccation and all sorts of things. So, um, as I say, it's been a fantastic innovation that's allowed them to do uh, wonderful things. If, if you look at the crotchets in detail, different species of caterpillars have the crotchets organised in different configurations, so sometimes complete circles, sometimes semicircles, sometimes the crotchets are of a uniform size and other times they're multiple, you know, two or three sizes. But these can be diagnostic for a particular group of caterpillars. So if you get out your hand lens and count the crotchets, you can say, well, that's definitely a satin eared moth, or that's definitely a pyrrhal moth. Um, or you might choose not to. Um, <clears throat> now there's lots of ways you can eat a leaf, so the, the entire world has been eaten um, all the time. So caterpillars, along with other insects, uh, are basically eating anything that's green. And so there's this race between plants to grow fast enough to replace lost tissue and these animals eating it down all the time. And so this uh, arms race is manifest in the chemistry of plants. So eucalypts are famously um, 
distasteful, they're full of you know, oils and all sorts of compounds, uh, digestibility inhibitors, um, tannins, you know, they're pretty horrible things to eat. If you go to other parts of the world where they grow gum trees as ornaments or plantations, uh, nothing eats them. But if you could, in Australia where they've co-evolved with insects and other animals that eat them, um, eucalypt leaves are heavily damaged. Uh, in fact, it's hard to find eucalypt leaf that's not damaged if you go into a forest. So from a caterpillar's point of view, you can eat a leaf in various ways. You can, you can chew the margins, which is what most large caterpillars do. Um, you can erode the surface. Um, now this works for small caterpillars because in eucalypts, the oils are often contained in glands, tiny glands that you can eat around if you've got small enough jaws. Um, and so they can get the nutritious parts without ingesting the inhibitors. And if they're extremely tiny, you can actually live inside the leaf and manoeuvre your way around the nutritious parts and leave an interesting trail with your dung pellets as you go. So the actual you know, food plant and the shape of the mine, again, can be diagnostic for certain types of caterpillars or even species. In Europe, where these are much better studied, they can often tell you what species it is, but in Australia you'd be struggling to get past what family of causes a particular type of damage. Um, this bottom one here is a leaf miner in Tasmanian pepper, the pepper berry. So, <clears throat> out of the world's 200,000 species of caterpillars, about 20 feet on meat. So, there's a tiny number of carnivores that uh, eat other species of uh, creatures. Uh, so they have evolved from plant feeding ancestors, but uh, for whatever reason I've decided that there's more nutrition to be gained by attacking um, other insects. So the best known are probably some of the Lycina larvae, the blue butterflies. A few of those have larvae that live in ants' nests and actually eat the, the brood of the ants. So they somehow subdue the ants, probably through pheromones or something like that, and in the process eat their larvae. Um, there's a group of moths called epiboropids that parasitise leafhoppers. So if you look at leafhoppers, you'll occasionally see a tiny caterpillar um, just under their wing buds usually, uh, chewing away at them. And there's a group of geometric moths in Hawaii that are ambush predators of uh, flies and ants. So their front legs in the top right there, you can see how the front legs have become uh, enormously enlarged with these long spikes, like a, you know, grappling hooks. And the, the mandibles are particularly um, sharp pointed. And being a geometric, they mimic sticks or leaves and they're very stationary. And then they suddenly leap on a creature that comes too close. Uh, this one here is a caught an ant, so the, the enlarged legs. These were only discovered about 30 years ago. But Hawaii, well, Hawaii and other islands, remote, remote islands, are very strange. Biology is often, you know, evolution does weird things on islands, and this is a particularly weird outcome for, uh, for caterpillars. Um, but just in the last few years, 2005, they discovered a caterpillar that lives in a case, it's a cosmopolitan rigid caterpillar, that catches snails. So it, uh, it uses silk to make a, a type of web that just a bit like, operates a bit like a spider's web. And a snail blunders into this web and then the caterpillar uh, subdues it and eats it alive. Um, so it's just as well, caterpillars are very small, otherwise they could be quite <laughs> scary creatures. Um, if, you're living, if you're living on plants, particularly in Australia, uh, probably your biggest challenge is to avoid being eaten by other creatures, and in particular ants. So Australia's got you know, 4,000 species of ants. Um, when I've had visiting biologists come overseas, you take them out in the field, they always complain about the ants. Um, they say, I've never seen ants like it, in those numbers or you know, aggressive things. So caterpillars have to avoid being eaten by ants. And one of the most common ways they do it is with this silk line. If, if you touch the caterpillar, it'll drop on a silk line. Uh, it can be a metre long or more. It's almost instantaneous. And then when the day just passed, it just climbs back up the silk line and carries on. Um, 
This one here, Lafira, is a butterfly larva that eats ant brood and it's armour plated. So the ants can't attack it. Um, uh, but it just creeps along and it, it, I think there's some ant brood here and just sort of chews away on the ant brood. Um, and the other option is to, is to placate the ants with food, in other words, give them something to do or to eat in, in the meantime. And um, the best study example of these mutualisms of Lycina butterflies. So most Lycina caterpillars have uh, glands or secretory organs that um, produce honey or nectar type compounds that ants eat. And so the ants will actually look after these caterpillars and, and um, herd them. Um, as you've famously seen here with the, uh, the checkered copper. And um, some of the organs produce sweet, sweet secretions, others produce um, uh, amino acids or compounds rich in amino acids, which uh, are scarce otherwise in the environment. So the butterfly larvae represent an important food source for the ants. So in that sense, they're, uh, uh, they're um, looked after. Um, I'll just see if I can get that. Uh, So this is one of uh, Greg Coote's recordings. So you can see the ant there um, just tending the larva. Um, and you can see the little organs. These are the ten tentacle type organs operating here, which are releasing um, a volatile chemical that's affecting the ant's behavior. So uh, it's quite an interesting mutualism. And in exchange, of course, the ants protect the caterpillar from parasites and other things like that. The other way to avoid predators is to be poisonous. So you give a bird a mouthful of uh, nasty poison, it's unlikely to come back for a second one. So some of these, uh, some of these caterpillars will uh, exude cyanide, it's just pure cyanide. Um, and um, this one here, Chalcosion, this group of caterpillars are all brightly covered and all highly toxic. Um, and, but you get mimicry rings, you get other caterpillars that are not toxic, that look exactly the same that have evolved uh, moving around the, uh, around the colour patterns. Um, and then you get um, species that sting their predators. So famously the cut moths here have these, these erectile little um, organs here that are uh, very sharp pointed. And they release uh, stinging compounds. So if you've ever been stung by these, you certainly feel it. You, you certainly drop the caterpillar and, and birds know not to eat them. And again, they're brightly coloured to, to warn lizards and birds. Uh, lizards and birds all have colour vision, so they, uh, they're well tuned to these patterns. So, broadly a challenge then is how to identify caterpillars, because uh, unlike the butterfly stage or the moth stage, uh, they're not as well known. Um, and indeed, um, many of them have not been reared, so people often report common caterpillars, but we don't really know what species of moth or butterfly, or more so moths, that it turns into. Most butterflies in South Australia have been reared, so I don't, I'm not aware there's any that haven't been reared. So we know the life histories of, of those, but that still leaves 2,000 moths in South Australia, of which only maybe 10% have been reared. Um, also, what information we do have is, is extremely scattered. Um, some of it's uh, unreliable and some of it's completely wrong. So you've got to be careful where you get your information from. Um, but um, in, in recent years, there's been these new tours that emerged based around the web that are broadly regarded as citizen science, where people can contribute observations and photographs to sort of a central website and uh, they use sort of crowd, well, they crowdsource identification. So somebody will say what they think it is, and someone will either confirm it or give a better suggestion. So the, 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 you sort of converge on the best answer for the time being. So iNaturalist is uh, perhaps the best known example. It comes out of the United States, supported by National Geographic and the California Academy of Sciences. And um, it's, uh, it's got something in the order of 150 million observations already over you know, less than 10 years. Um, so that's one useful source. Then there's aggregators like the Atlas of Living Australia, 
which gather information from wherever they can find it and bring it together in a single uh, location. So you can source maps, photographs, nomenclature, all those sorts of things. The ALA sadly is not hugely reliable in, in my view. Uh, I'd use it with caution for less well-known groups. It's good for birds, mammals, butterflies, but when you get into moths, it's, uh, it's only about 80% reliable in my view. And then um, we already have a few existing resources to recognise caterpillars. So you know, young children are introduced to caterpillars in an early stage, but they're anatomically completely wrong. Um, <laughs> it, they get the general idea. So uh, caterpillars don't have antennae that look like that. Uh, they have six or eight eyes rather than two, and rather more legs than those. Um, this is slightly better, but it's got too many front legs, um, not enough back legs, and uh, no mouth at all. Um, and uh, perhaps if you combine those three things there, you might get a reasonable facsimile. Yeah, that's actually about tuning, however. Yes. <laughs> if you look uh, elsewhere, in the last perhaps you know, 15 to 20 years, there's been a lot of interest in field guides to caterpillars. So the famous one in North America is one by Dave Wagner from 2005. It's about 450 pages long. North America has very nice caterpillars because it's close to the, uh, to the neotropics. But, um, and, and Dave spent his entire life photographing caterpillars. He's a good photographer. Um, and just lately, it's been turned into a, into a phone app in 2019 using these sort of simple dichotomous type keys. So, you know, you choose this or that, this or that type of thing, and it converges to an answer, along with pictures and support. So that's... Uh, that's very popular. I think this is out of print now, the, the book, but this is, you can buy this for, for about $10 in, in the US. Um, in Australia, a, a fellow called Don Herbison Evans, who's a, a field naturalist, was based in Sydney, now lives in London, and his partner, Stella Crosley, uh, back in about 2014, put up this, uh, sorry, this, this website called Caterpillars in Australia. Um, it's a bit idiosyncratic, but it's, um, being improved a lot by people contributing information, you know, I mean, fixing mistakes, putting in new pictures, and it's actually very comprehensive. Uh, the issue is it covers the whole of Australia, so it's, it's rather large. So, and you can't interrogate it for a subset, you can't say, well, just show me the caterpillars from South Australia, for example. Um, but it's good from the point of view that you can uh, say, show me the caterpillars on eucalyptus or acacia, so you can. You can look at it from the point of view of food plants. Um, and it's got some sort of pictures that help you, help guide you. You know, you can look at things bigger than 10 centimetres, for example, or something like that, or hairy caterpillars versus smooth. Um, but it's more or less a go-to site for most people in Australia, would, would be this site. I don't know how much longer Don will keep it going. It's, he told me last year it's a huge imposition on him. <laughs> But it often happens that you know, one person ends up with all the, all the work with these sorts of uh, resources. And then we put out this thing, uh, the BCSA put out this in 2019, which covers 175 uh, species of, uh, of South, mainly South Australia, but it does extend to Victoria and Western Australia as well. Um, and again, we more or less crowdsource many of the photographs too, so it's a, a collaboration in that view, uh, in that point of view. But um, it's, um, we've got a lot more caterpillars since that time, so we could probably double the size of it um, just four or five years later, if we were so inclined. Um, I like to think this is the only book ever published with the back end of a caterpillar on the, <laughs> on the cover. Um, and then um, Kathy Bird and Diane Moyle from Hobart put out this computer-based key called the Caterpillar Key, uh, also in 2019. This was funded by the, um, by the Quarantine Service in Canberra to help uh, uh, people identify cat unknown caterpillars coming to Australia on projects. So it's highly technical. Uh, it's meant to be global. In fact, it, it's, in theory, it could be used anywhere in the world to identify a particular group of caterpillars, but it's not really accessible for people starting out or for, you know, natural historians. It's, as I say, it's a, it's a rather technical 
uh, thing. It's nevertheless on the web and anyone can access it if, if you wish. Um, and uh, it's also designed to be continuously improved uh, over time as more photographs get added to it. But um, it's rather confronting to use, I'd have to say. Um, and then there's this group here. Within iNaturalist, people can set up little projects where you invite other people to contribute photographs. So you might, in this case, uh, link it up to life cycles. So you, you would send your pictures to the, uh, to the uh, coordinator of this group and they'd be loaded up. And so you can see there's almost 2,000 observations uh, in this group covering 113 species and 18 people have contributed. So that's continuously building uh, over time. It's, uh, it, it's pretty good. The only difficulty with it is you need to have a fair idea of what your category is to start with. You need to know what family it is. Um, otherwise you're going to be looking at a hunt, you know, at least 113 photographs to sort of pick it out by matching it. Uh, that's fine, maybe up to 100 pictures, but when you get, as I say, there's uh, you know, 25,000 different species in the whole of Australia, it'll eventually get impossible. So our challenge then is to look at the caterpillars and see what sort of features they have that people can easily see and use those to, for people to uh, start to um, make some headway. So things like the pattern on the head of the caterpillar uh, can be interesting, you know, blue background, uh, small black blotches versus stripes versus different coloured backgrounds. Um, some species have things like tentacles that are easy to observe and you can use that to um, divide the groups. Uh, here's just a list of some of the features, you know, colour, uh, pattern, pattern elements. Is it hairy or smooth? Is it fairly immobile or is it quite active? Um, do they hang out in groups or are they solitary? Um, if you poke them, do they sit there and look at you or do they thrash about? Uh, how do they feed? What sort of plants are they on? If, if you know the food plant precisely, if it's on, say, a geranium, more than you can reduce it to about six or eight possibilities immediately just on the food plant. So that, that can be a good um, entry point into identifying your caterpillar. And then um, caterpillar appearance is often conserved within family groups. So this caterpillar here is, is one of the browns, possibly the common brown, I'm not sure. But it has this little pair of projections at the back end. It's a plain green caterpillar, rather sluggish, uh, with the head quite distinct from the rest of the body. So that's one of the browns, or this family, or subfamily, satiety. Uh, likewise, hawk moth larvae are pretty easy to pick. They're smooth, robust, quite large, and they have a horn at the back, commonly with eye spots along the side, but not always. Um, so once you see one hawk moth larvae, you've probably seen just about all of them in theory. You know, it's a, just a matter of um, going to the spingy page and narrowing it down from there. Um, one thing we thought we'd do in the app or the website would be to start out with say the, the most common dozen caterpillars that people find. So if you look at our naturalist, you can actually rank these things by numbers of observations. So we just sort of chose the top 12 for South Australia. And it's, it's these, you won't be surprised, they're all common things across the hawk moth, the moth, the tiger moth, etc. So we'd probably just offer those as pictures on a page and you can just sort of, the question is, is it one of these or not? And the chances are it may well be one of those. And if it's not, we'd go deeper into the key. Um, So you might have some supportive pictures. Here's the, uh, the grapevine day moth. So this is a native moth that's adopted grapevines as a food plant. So it's moved on from native related plants. Quite distinctive. So we've got, we have a few pictures of uh, the side view, uh, the detail of the pattern on the head and thorax. So it's, it's dark yellow with a cross pattern there. And, um, and a top view here. So broadly speaking, that would be enough to give you about 99% confidence that that's what it is. Uh, Ocrogaster, it's a very hairy caterpillar, extremely hairy. The hairs are ginger and white in colour. 
uh, would have a picture of the head, so it's got a, um, a head with no uh, colour pattern other than a dark brown polished appearance. But this interesting behaviour where the caterpillars are processionary when, uh, as they get older. So this is the only processionary, the only common processionary caterpillar in South Australia, and it's associated with acacia. Um, so that combination of features would pretty well clinch it for you. And then the most common gregarious caterpillar in South Australia would be this one, the, the gum leaf skeletonizer. So it's on eucalypts, uh, it erodes the leaf surface. As a hairy caterpillar, they commonly stack the old head capsules as they molt, they stack the head capsules um, on top of their head. Very weird behaviour. No, no one really knows why. Um, and no other caterpillars do it. Um, now, just these last couple of slides I've got, or last few slides, I just want to contrast a group of moths that um, are rather similar to look at in the moth stage but have very distinctive caterpillars and then uh, I'll show you the vice versa situation as well. So cut moths have, uh, as I say, distinctive larvae but similar adults. So here's a typical cut moth uh, adult, you know, brown, rather plain moth. Don't often see them, they don't come to light very much. Um, and of course, cut moths are well known as a group because they have these distinctive rigid cocoons, uh, which they emerge by cutting the top off uh, and, and popping up. They're rigid because when the caterpillar is spinning the cocoon, it secretes calcium oxalate that strengthens the, the silk. Um, and these can last for like 10 years. They, they erode very slowly in the environment, unlike normal cocoons. So here's the, here's the underside of the, the female moth. They, they lay imbricated eggs like this and then cover them with all this furry material off the underside of the abdomen. Um, oh, sorry, I should say that the, the larvae different appearance, behaviour, distribution and the particular host plants they use as well. So here's just a quick overview of uh, different species in this one genus, Dorotifera. So quite striking caterpillars, quite different to look at. Yet if you line up the moths, the moths will look much the same, more or less. Um, so here, here they are. Um, so different permutations of colour, shape, all the rest of it. Um, you get this strange one here. The, the moth stage of this one and that one, um, you have to dissect look the genitalia to pick them apart. The moths are so similar, but the larvae are extremely different. This one is solitary, this one's gregarious, for one, for one thing. Um, if you look at Oxley Eye, which is the most common one on the Adelaide Hills, uh, the larva is brightly coloured when it's young and it changes colour as it ages. Um, they have the head tucked under the body too, you don't often see the head, but this is the head here, sort of, uh, it's retra retracted within the thorax here. And the behaviour differs, as I say, some are gregarious, so um, vulnerans, quadrigutata, are, uh, have gregarious larvae that feed collectively and erode the leaf, uh, this sort of behaviour here. Uh, obviously I is solitary. So we've tried to make a bit of a key, this is work in progress, but we're trying to make up a sort of dichotomous key so you can, you'll be presented with some questions and you just have a choice of two options and you progress your way through the key and there'll be some photographs to support the decisions as well. And the different a bit in distribution, so depending on where you are in Australia, if you're in, in Perth for example, there can only be a possibility of three species, you can exclude the other two just on distribution alone. Um, same in Tasmania, Tasmania just has three species, um, it's missing the other two. And then you get groups which have caterpillars that are rather similar. So the one we're struggling with at the moment is clinias, which are very common moths. You get them in gardens, they eat garden plants. and They probably originally fed on acacias, but many species have you know, adopted wider food plants. They're all broadly um, elongated with stripy patterns with, with crimson or orange blotches in various locations on the body. So one thing we don't know, for example, is how variable they are within the species. 
um, so they're, they're very common. Not many people reel them out to confirm what the moth stage actually is. It's quite likely that some of these uh, ones here actually could be a multitude of species. You could have three or four species with a virtually identical larva. Um, and so you either need to dissect the moth or rear it through or look at its DNA or something like that. Um, and then there's various cleanliest caterpillars are known from southern Australia that have been photographed that have never been reared to the moth stage, so we don't even know what moth they turn into. They might not even be named species, possibly. So if you see cleanliest, read them out and um, put them aside. And that's the end. So, <laughs> Questions of Peter. Yes, Gary. Perhaps a, a, a comment as much as uh, a question. Quite often out in the uh, conservation areas, we see the birds collecting the caterpillars, but usually on very high you know, top end of the eucalypts. And I look for the caterpillars down lower where I can see something and see very little. Um, just the frequency of the caterpillars to choose to go so high. I mean, I, I just wonder. Yes. Yeah. So, so the question is, why do the birds forage at different levels in the eucalypts, and, and why are caterpillars concentrated at the tops? The, the, the main reason they probably go to the tops is because the most nutritious leaves are at the top, you know, the young, youngest leaves. Um, a lot of caterpillars will move up and down the trunk during the daytime or, and the night, so they'll they actually move around the tree quite a lot. Um, they'll also try to move away from other individuals in the same species just to spread themselves out. But uh, as you know, birds have very sharp vision, so they're a strong selection force, I'm sure, on caterpillars for behaviour and pattern. So you see these extraordinary patterns in caterpillars that are selected for by birds. Um, and you do get both mimicry, as I said before, where you get, you know, um, quite um, undefended caterpillars resembling poisonous caterpillars and at the same time you get poisonous species that are unrelated that mimic each other because it's simpler for the birds to learn some simple colour combinations or patterns and, and they vary around the world if, if you uh, go to other forests and other parts of the world you'll see repeated colour patterns in caterpillars that you won't see in Australia so whether that's a, a random outcome or whether you know, there's, there's a curl of all with these things over millions of years, I, I don't know. But, uh, but camouflage also, you know, eucalypts are a very unusual plant because, you know, leaf shape, colour, texture, they're very shiny, glossy leaves. Um, so you, you get caterpillars that look just like them. Um, but you go to North America where you've got broad, um, hardwood tree leaves, which, you know, look very different and the caterpillars are correspondingly different as well. For se several years, I have observed a caterpillar that looks like the monarch but does not have the antennae and it feeds on the tar vine exclusively. And I've been wondering what it is. Thanks for that question. So the caterpillar on the tarbine, um, the, the most famous caterpillar on the tarbine is, uh, is, is the spinget called um, the white iron hawk moth, which is um, a, a caterpillar about, as, about the size of your finger with, with a horn at one end and um, a combination of stripes and, and, and small dots. It's, it's a very variable caterpillar. In fact, if you look at them very closely, it resembles the, the dot paintings of a, you know, an, an Aboriginal landscape to a degree. But it's um, also a, it's a moth that um, has this boom-bust cycle. So it becomes super abundant after rain in the inland. It, 
It's been recorded in Adelaide, but it really breeds in the northern Flinders Ranges right through to other springs and um, across that arid, semi-arid zone, because tarvine itself is one of these um, species of plant that has these enormous fluctuations in biomass. So in drought years, dry years, you hardly see much at all. In wet years, it's, it's everywhere. But um, it's, it's a uh, caterpillar that's often it was eaten by some Aboriginal people. Um, I think it's part of the foundation story of the Yellow Springs area, you know, of the, of the ranges, um, which resemble two large caterpillars coming together. You know, the, the gap of the ranges there at Yellow Springs is part of that caterpillar dreaming story. Uh, so there's, um, what is it, yep, Yeparinia and, and several other species of hawk moths uh, tied up in that, in that story. But, um, but you mentioned the, the wanderer larva. There is, of course, the lesser wanderer, which looks very like the wanderer larva, but smaller. So that's, that's a, um, an agaristid moth. So it's related to the one that was on the very, very first slide. It's in that same family. So they're, they're striped caterpillars. Um, so that's a genus called Cruria, C-R-U-R-I-A, Cruria, Dongonai, it is. It's actually quite uncommon, although they're often locally common for a particular time and you don't see them for some years. So because tarvine is so um, unpredictable in space and time, so, so are the moths that feed on it. But somehow they find them and they have a, a bonanza year and then you might not see them for 10 years. Yes, yeah, so that's Cruria. That's, and commonly said, try to prefer a bit of a sound that. Another question? Do birds have to taste a particular uh, caterpillar to know that, learn that it's poisonous, or do, is it in built in? As far as I know, they have to all learn from first principles. So, um, you know, young birds, which are quite naive to these things, will often uh, make a poor decision and then they, they'll, they'll vomit out the bird, uh, the, the, the caterpillar. But they learn rather quickly to associate that colour or shape of a caterpillar with a bad experience. But there are birds that do special, there's a few birds that specialise on noxious caterpillars, famous for cuckoos. So cuckoos are adapted to eat hairy caterpillars. And um, if you ever watch a cuckoo take a hairy caterpillar, they, they, they flog it on a branch. They, they grab it by one end and, and belt it until it's dead. And uh, uh, so it's not shedding hairs as they try and swallow it. And, and then they swallow it. And if they will then regurgitate, sometime later, they regurgitate a ball of compressed hair. Um, seeing how owls regurgitate bones and things like this. Cuckoos regurgitate little pellets of caterpillar hair. Uh, I defy you to find one in the environment, but, um, <laughs> but they do this several times a day, apparently, when they can get onto hairy caterpillars. Uh, if you look on the web, you'll see some quite nice pictures of cuckoos with hairy caterpillars in their beak. In fact, uh, when we were doing the book, I was looking for some pictures of birds with caterpillars in their beak, and if you sort of lurk on the you know, the Birdo's websites, they'll occasionally have a picture there um, that you can sort of uh, use for the purpose. Um, famously, if you know the white-fronted chat, which occurs uh, uh, around salt marshes around Adelaide, um, in the breeding season, sort of now, uh, they go after large, smooth caterpillars they get off saltbush and uh, those coastal succulent plants. And the birds can actually hold four or five caterpillars in their beak at once by some mysterious process. But I've seen photographs of them with a, a line of caterpillars draped over their, their lower beak. Um, so as I say, at the beginning, caterpillars are very nutritious, so they're highly sought after. It's just that uh, they're hard often to, well, first of all, see, because they're so camouflaged. Uh, they're often in retreats. Uh, they're often nocturnal. In fact, one reason why caterpillars are probably largely nocturnal is because birds are not. So caterpillars might be pushed into the night time because you, you wouldn't think they would prefer to be nocturnal because it's colder. They're, they're cold-blooded, so they'd be better served by being active in the sunshine. But I think the predation pressure from birds is so great that they've been forced into the night time. And there's not many nocturnal birds eat caterpillars, so owls don't 
eat them. Uh, out of night jars might. They might go for a large category, they can see it. But by and large, they're pretty safe in the, in the night time. Yep. Why do they make the caterpillars make that uh, Oh, but yep. Yeah, so the quick question is, why do those caterpillars make that uh, train? So that th these are the uh, um, these are the uh, opera gaster caterpillars. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know that it's known um, because they form big populations on small shrubs like acacias. They sometimes eat entire foliage off the plant, and I suspect they might then go looking for um, an another shrub nearby. Um, but it, yes, I don't know. It's, perhaps they have faith in the leader. I don't know. They you know, follow me. I don't know whether there's a, a location nearby, but um, it, it is very weird behaviour. It's known that that particular subfamily of caterpillars uh, includes processory caterpillars in most continents, but only a handful of species. So in North America, there's only you know a small number. Same in Europe and here. Um, yeah, it's, it's odd behaviour. It's obviously must be quite old because it evolved a long time ago. And it's in the descendants of all these group of caterpillars in different land masses, so it's tens of millions of years old as a behaviour, presumably. But it hasn't evolved commonly elsewhere in other groups, so yes, it's, maybe it might be an old evolutionary innovation that's really got no useful purpose. I don't know. Is there one over here? Yeah. Uh, yes, um, generally, the, it's, it, oh sorry, yeah, other differences between male and female caterpillars. Yes, yeah, so, so caterpillars do have a gender. Um, you have to dissect, to be sure, you have to dissect them. So there's incipient testes, for example, um, in, in male caterpillars, but they're internal. Um, uh, I'm just thinking of any examples where they might be colour or shape different. I, I can't think of any. So, so basically very subtle differences, yep. Um, it's interesting in um, some of the silkworms, you know, humans have selected for uh, females, female dominance. So because females make bigger cocoons with more silk, there's been selection against male um, silkworms. And so in some species, they're 90% female in, in that, in that uh, lineage. You need a few males, of course, but broadly speaking, yeah, you're after females for this size. And all of this work that you're doing, can we access it now? Uh, probably not easily. Um, we're, we're fairly untidy workers, aren't we? We sort of scattered all over the place in files. Um, we're drawing it together. Uh, we're probably at the stage where we can start putting it into a website, perhaps. A, attached to the BCSA site where people can see pictures and things and, and um, the, the little key I showed that that dichotomous key where you, you know answer questions we're sort of building those as we go so some of them we're reasonably happy with others are still a work in progress so as, as we get a reasonable one we could put it up and just get people to critique it try it out and let us know if you think it's sensible is it understandable um, yeah Yeah, so as <clears throat> Jan said, you know, what sort of illustrations are we after? So we have looked at thousands of caterpillar pictures, as you imagine, there's thousands out there, but only a very small percentage of really high quality pictures. But the things you should photograph, if you've got a caterpillar, is, is, is a side view, a top view, and, and a face on view. It turns out the faces of caterpillars are quite interesting, so they range from being sort of plain coloured, you know, red or brown, to having all sorts of elaborate stripes and spots and and, and even different shapes, you know, some heart shapes, some are perfectly round, some, some are, you know, quite convex. Um, so face shape and colour is, is quite rich in characters, but poorly photographed, very poorly photographed. Um, people tend to photograph, you know, colourful large caterpillars, of course, but we're after any photographs, so even plain brown and white caterpillars. Uh, you know, which grubs, which, you know, 
widely known. Um, we struggle to get a good picture of a witchly grub for the book. Uh, there's lots of poor quality pictures of witchly grubs, but very few you know, useful pictures that show the features you want to show that make it a witchly grub and not some other sort of underground caterpillar. Um, so, um, so yeah, photograph lots of caterpillars. Um, try and associate it with a food plant if you can. If you know what the plant is, annotate it to the to, to, to the picture. If you don't, we'll just photograph the plant as well, preferably with a caterpillar on it. And we can often show it to a botanist so you can tell us what the plant is. Um, and also, if you're so inclined, try and read them through. So if you look at, um, you know, anthelid moths, um, in which there's a lot of common species in Adelaide. In fact, there's several living backyards and eat grass. Now, we, when we did the book, we weren't confident, we had lots of pictures of anthelid larvae, that we weren't confident about associating them to the particular species of anthelid moth. So it took us ages to find someone to actually read it through and photograph the adult moth with the caterpillar that it came from. And that clinched it. But we had, you know, three or four candidate pictures at one stage that, that could be the larva of this particular uh, moth. There's a genus called Tyrolosera, which is a nightmare. You know, there's lots of pictures of caterpillars because they're common, but very few have been reared through to the moth stage. So we can't be certain what they turn into. Um, yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Yes, yeah, so Jan was saying we're after doing little clips, maybe five or ten seconds of behaviour. So, uh, of, of the caterpillar moving, um, you know, feeding. Um, it's defence posture. Some, some caterpillars, if you touch them, they, they curl forward. They tuck their head under, like a question mark shape. That, that's quite, uh, quite an interesting feature for some species. Uh, others will drop on a, on a line. Um, some will thrash. A few of them regurgitate their stomach contents on you. If, if you poke them, they'll regurgitate this brown, horrible, snotty fluid, uh, which is, I guess, a defence against birds or lizards or something. Uh, so those sorts of things are worth capturing in a, you know, as I say, a five or ten second video as well. Yeah. Another question. Gil? Can you guide us to any literature that tells you clues about how to wear caterpillars? Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So the question from Gil is, uh, any um, guidance around publications or things around rearing caterpillars? Um, look, there's nothing I can think of immediately, Gil, but um, a lot of it's trial and error. We, we had living in Adelaide back in the late 60s, early 70s, Norman McFarlane, who was an American entomologist who was at the museum here before he returned to California. He um, he, he was the best rearer of caterpillars in Australia, and he's never been surpassed. Um, he, um, he just, again, did it by trial and error, but he was very, very thorough. Um, the main thing is to keep them clean. They, if you keep them crowded in, in a moist environment, particularly a warm, moist environment like indoors, uh, viruses and bacteria um, get them quite quickly, and they'll die within a few days. So the thing is to keep them um, keep them clean because they put in a lot of fecal material daily if you feed them. Um, you need it's like having a pet. You know you've got to clean them every day. Put them on clean tissue paper, uh, fresh plant material as much as you can. If you put leaves in, they'll last up to about a week. But you can put leaves in the fridge and keep them for about a month. And if you say you've been collecting somewhere remote and you've brought back plant material, you can put it in the freezer. Um, and they'll eat it within a day or two of the thawing before it collapses entirely. Um, for some caterpillars, people read them in apple or potato slices. There's a few caterpillars will eat, even though they've got um, a particular preferred food plant, they will eat apple slices. Um, so that helps carry them through to the pupa stage. But broadly speaking, keep them clean, um, not too dry, not too moist, uh, keep them out of direct sun. Um, and um, yeah, plenty of green material and not too crowded. Um, if I breed something from eggs, so I collect in moths that light, you often get a female that lay, say, 50 eggs. Um, rear them in batches of, say, five or ten, because one batch gets disease when you're not contaminating the, the, the rest of your batch. 
but um, but yes, it's a well, actually, trial and error, I must say. Yeah. John, before your table comes up, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, it was getting back to the question of uh, the chemical defences of, of the caterpillars and, and the uh, adult stages. Um, to what extent are those chemicals derived from the food they eat, such as in the wanderers with their milk uh, Are there other ways in which it's, it's developed biologically? And the uh, flow on question from that is uh, what predator species uh, respond to these. You've mentioned <coughs> birds and lizards. What about uh, wasps and spiders and so on? Yep. Yep. So that's an interesting question. So the question is, you know, what's the origin of these compounds, these chemicals in caterpillars? So collectively across caterpillars there are probably thousands of these novel compounds. Now, as John says, some of them derive from poisonous plants. So caterpillars that feed on poisonous plants like oleanders and and uh, apicinaceae, those sorts of groups of plants, they do sequester the chemicals out of the plant directly into their body. And so, um, do you know senecios, you know, um, those daisies that have bright yellow flowers? Rag, ragwort would be an example. They're, they're, they're quite toxic, and uh, the chemicals that feed on them are similarly poisonous to birds. So those compounds are biologically active. Some of them affect heart rate, for example, uh, glycosides. Um, now, other caterpillars actually have, a, have the mechanisms in their own body to produce novel chemicals. So they can, they can be feeding on quite innocuous plants, but they can somehow turn the chemistry of the plant or use it as raw material to produce com complex compounds. A classic example would be the, the cut moths. So they feed on eucalyptus, which are toxic, but I mean, it's only, it's only yeah, simple oils, you know, terpenes, those sorts of things. Um, People often use them as flavouring agents. I mean, most spices that you buy and use in food are actually antifetins. They're, they're evolved by plants to defend themselves from caterpillars. So they're you know, strong tasting or they're toxic, but in small amounts they make food taste nice. So, uh, but you know, too much of, of anything's bad for you. Um, but the cut them off caterpillar, those spikes. They've actually just recently published uh, some work on the chemistry of those spikes. They've got more than a hundred compounds in them. The toxins in those spikes have got more than a hundred different proteins in them, all generated by the caterpillar. So they're not directly derived from the food plant. Um, so the question is why, why bother with a hundred odd chemicals when two or three might be sufficient? Nobody knows, but. Uh, there's lots of interesting chemistry in caterpillars to be to be worked out. In, in the honeydew that um, the caterpillars secrete, yes. my understanding is that that also has lots of different amino acids. Yes, yes. So, so amino acids are, are very sought out. But they're, so they're the building blocks of protein. So animals that or animals, of course, have to have amino acids to produce protein. So they amino acids are very sought after. And in the Australian, because the Australian environment is very nutrient poor, you know, we're an old continent, lots of erosion, so nutrients in the Australian environment uh, are uh, very sought after, they were strongly defended. So, uh, you know, the whole purpose of an ant colony is to basically go and find um, um, energy in the form of sugars. And, and to find amino acids. That's what, that's what ants do for their day job. They wander around with the, these two compounds. And so, butterfly, well, I see that butterflies have worked out that you know you can lure ants towards yourself because they want amino acids and sugar, but at the same time you can use the you can use the ants to defend yourself against parasites and predators. So hence this mutualism. But um, but um, amino acids. Um, take a lot of nitrogen, they're at 14% nitrogen. So the Australian environment is less than 1% nitrogen. So whatever is producing amino acids is somehow being able to concentrate um, at a point source and therefore has to defend them. Otherwise they're going to be lost to other creatures that are chasing amino acids. Other questions? So 
people who are browsing and grazing. Browsing and grazing, miners. Yes, Is there anything that moths and butterflies and by extension caterpillars have to offer agriculture other than precious metals? Oh yes, well I mean I mentioned silk, so silk's a multi-billion dollar industry, but also as um, biological control agents, so, so um, that horrible spiny, it was a prickly pear, the prickly pear that took over Queensland in the 1920s and 30s, that was, that was um, controlled by capnoblastis moths, source from Argentina I think. So for biocontrol agents they're, they're very important. Um, also for um, a source of interesting um, chemicals. I mean, it's only in the last 25 years people have had the technology to, you know, cost efficiently prospect through caterpillars for unusual chemicals. And I'm so, sort of cool. interested yeah. in this because I think um, I'm coming at it from a conservation viewpoint. Um, I have noticed that animals that are useful to capitalism seem to get favoured nation status. Yes, yes. Well, that's just the human experience. And I wondered whether the butterflies and moths have got much going for them in that environment. Well, butterflies certainly have. Uh, you know, the, the aesthetic appeal of butterflies is pretty universal. So you find most listed insects that are listed for conservation formally are butterflies, which is fine because I mean they're sort of ambassadors for other insects. So hence, you know, moths sort of hang out on butterflies' coattails. Um, but um, but you see in other cultures, moths are treated as nocturnal butterflies. Um, so um, you know, uh, it, it, the Spanish talk about nocturnal butterflies, which we talk about moths. Yeah. So the, just the nomenclature in common usage can reflect people's attitudes to these things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, strictly speaking, butterflies. The, the, the subset of moths called butterflies are strict that they're a subset of moths. They fly moths as what they really are. But uh, we call them butterflies. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Gary? Gary first. Uh, Gary first, right? Up a second. Why do uh, the uh, caterpillars accumulate in groups of 10 or 20 clumps? I see it with a couple of different varieties of Caterpillars? Yes. It's, it's a yeah, so, so the question is why do caterpillars tend to be clumped in distribution? Um, probably the main reason is because the female moths lay eggs in clusters. So as the female moves around the environment, she'll lay half a dozen up to a couple of hundred eggs. And, and so the larvae tend to be a bit, a bit colonial in, in that respect. In, in some species, the caterpillars are highly dispersive. So, you know, there might be an egg clump of, of 100 eggs, but the first instar larvae move apart quite quickly. And some of them actually, some of the hairy species are, are lightweight enough to be airborne. They, they get airborne in a strong wind and, and they carry it downwind. So some of the caterpillars that are pests on fruit trees and in gardens that have a wide host range, the reason they have a wide host range part is because they, they just drop out of the sky basically and, and hope that the plant will support them. Yeah. Showed a picture there of a landscale being featured on by a caterpillar in Hawaii. I understand a lot of the Hawaiian landscale species have got extinct in the feral animals and so on. Yes. Does that also suggest a lot of the moths have gone extinct? Oh, yes, yes. Hawaii has lost a lot of its insect fauna in the last 150 years. Um, there's been some disastrous introductions of parasites, including this happened in Australia too. You know, um, CSIRO back in the 1960s and 70s, there was a big push on, in, on biological control because it was very popular and cutting edge. And they sourced some wasp parasites from China that were not sufficiently well known as to what they actually attacked. And it turns out some of these were egg parasites of caterpillars with um, commercially important crops. But it turned out that these wasps attacked native caterpillars as well, that they weren't particularly specific to pest caterpillars. And so um, there's been quite strong declines in moth populations in some parts of Australia uh, as a result. Um, in North America, there's a 
fly parasite taken there for gypsy moth, which is a European pest that got introduced in, into the US in the 1980s. And the fly parasite was thought to be fairly specific, uh, which it is in Europe, it's natural home. When you bring it into a new environment, it, it, it broadened its host range to many native caterpillars in North America. So there's a, there's a bit of a downer now on in introducing parasites um, across the world compared to sort of 30, 40 years ago. And another question, would you know how many feral moths we have in South Australia? I'll put a few on INAM and they come up as a... Yes. I remember. They'd be in the order of 20. They'd be in the order of 20, yeah. There's, in, in houses, uh, there would be, like in terms of clothes moths and related things, there'd be a good seven or eight species of clothes moth, that, uh, uh, which would be like three or four families of small moths. Yeah. Question in the back there. It seems like a kind of silly question I'm thinking about. Do they need water? Do they, do they ingest water? Yeah, yes, indeed. Uh, yeah. So the question is, do caterpillars need water? So uh, they certainly do. Um, and they have interesting adaptations to it. So one of the challenges for caterpillars is, is, is to retain the water. So they have the, the exterior skin of the caterpillar is quite waterproof. And um, the only openings to the exterior is through the, through the breathing holes, the spiracles, which are very small. Um, and, then the, and they're fringed with microscopic hairs to help hold water vapour inside the caterpillar. But um, in dry periods, caterpillars will retreat to shade and moist situations. And, and they will actually drink water. If, if there's condensation on leaves in the morning, they'll, they'll actually drink the water directly. And um, in, in very dry periods, they'll both completely dormant and perhaps even go down in, into the leaf litter to help you know, conserve moisture. Um, it's thought that some of the hairy, some of the caterpillars that have got very short, dense hair, like almost like um, corduroy, that, that's thought to be more related to um, yeah, holding moisture close to their body rather than any defence uh, or something like that. And then you've got those that live in burrows or, or tunnels that, that maintain high moisture levels. Yeah. They, um, most caterpillars can float. Uh, I've certainly seen floating caterpillars. Um, it's interesting with these big floods we get down in Australia with, with overland water flow. With them, most certainly caterpillars must get redistributed by just being passively carried along the water, certainly. And uh, in fact, that could explain why some of the inland species are very widespread. So if you go through the Channel Country in, in the arid zone, you'll find the same sorts of moth species almost everywhere. And some of them are feed as caterpillars on the, um, the ephemeral plants that come up in the last six months or less, those flowering daisies, that, and then they disappear for years until the next wet season uh, or inland wet. And so um, I suspect part of the reason why they're widespread is perhaps they just passively moved around the landscape. Of course, that, that happens with weeds as well. That's why you get so many widespread weeds in the inland, is because the, these big wet years just move seeds all around the countryside. Anne's got a last question before we finish this. That's actually sort of a segue from what you were just saying, Peter. I've just come back from the East Coast, and across New South Wales, the paper whites are in the thousands. Yeah. But there's not capras out there, you see? So I've got when those migrating butterflies move through, yes. are, they, are they literally looking for capras, or are they... What are yeah, that's a good question. So why are the paper whites moving to the coast away from their food plant capitals. Yeah, it's, I don't think there's a definitive answer, but that sort of behaviour where you get dispersal at high densities is common in some other insect groups as well. But, um, plague locust is another one. The, the very first year I went to Tasmania, I was working on the south, south coast track, um, which is as far south as you go in Australia, basically. Um, and at the high tide mark on the beaches, there were millions of drowned Australian plague locusts, which would have bred near Broken Hill, probably. And then they just disperse out to the coast. And um, so they would have flown out into the Southern Ocean, brought back on the tide, and they were, they were like a metre wide and, you know, six inches high, uh, countless millions. And we do get cable white in Tasmania occasionally, so they, they get blown across the fast straight and turn up just um, wandering around. 
it's, yeah, I think it's semi-directed. Like people report seeing them moving in a direct, a deeper direction. Um, I mean, this far south, you tend to see just scattered individuals, but um, in the eastern states, you'll see hundreds at a time sometimes, you know, more or less moving together. Uh, but as to why they do it, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it might be that they've, because it's been a boom year for breeding, they've probably stripped all the leaves of all the capras in the inland, and they're literally desperate to find new sources of food plants. There's been reports of capras in the botanic gardens in Adelaide being stripped in some years. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. But on the eight lines, I don't think there's any capras in the but, house yeah. of people. Yeah. Peter, I wonder whether the La Nina effect, which tends to bring you from the centre, yeah. has that impact? Yes. Yes. So, as Jerry says, these La Nina cycles, which have this um, this sort of uh, repeatable pattern of you know, moisture and air movement, but it, it, it's irregular. Like, it's not, um, you can't predict it precisely, but it's, it's a semi-regular cycle. I mean, animals and plants do adapt to that. And some of this boom-bust behaviour, you know, is, is, is suited to exploit it. So, you know, you know species that can breed up very quickly, ha have a compressed life cycle of just a few months. So, for example, caper white is one of the fastest development times of any butterfly caterpillar. Uh, for, for a butterfly of its size, it, it, it just races through its life cycle, gets to the adult stage, and then disperses. Um, and one thing is seeing in Australia with, with global warming is that some butterflies are going into two generations a year. In Tasmania, we have a, a beautiful swallowtail butterfly that uh, has an annual life cycle, except in the far northeast of the state where it's the warmest. It's, it's, um, some populations are going into a second generation. So you're seeing butterflies in November and butterflies again in March. So it's squeezing in a second generation because there's enough warmth in the environment to complete its life cycle twice in a year. So that's, that's going to be more common for all. Look, thank you very much, Peter. It's been a really interesting talk tonight, and I'd just like to hand over to Jan Forrest, our life member, to give you a vote of thanks. Well, on behalf of everyone, Peter, thank you so much for, for coming and giving us this amazing talk. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled that you, you're able to come. Uh, Peter and I, got, I I've, known, I've known Peter for... Since 1973. <laughs> since 1973. <laughs> so that's a long time. And um, we've worked very closely together with the, with the book and he also contributed to the Butterfly book. And he is a, a, a incredibly valuable um, support to butterfly conservation, and we really appreciate uh, his input and his knowledge. And so, on behalf of everyone, <coughs> I'd like to say thank you so much for coming, and it's a fantastic talk. Thank you. Okay.